um, policy makers into driving uh, this revitalization. So, uh, as I said, um, he's the perfect person to understand how important it is to think about research in a way that has a clear way into impacting social life and the lives of, of the speakers. So, with further ado, I just welcome Catherine Jones speaking for Colin Williams this morning. Thank you. So, yes, um, okay, well, as um, uh, Mindy said, um, I work with the the North London Community Agriculture Club Centre for Language Planning, and we do um, balance work, which is um, um, research that feeds into policy, some of it academic, some of it commissioned by the Welsh Government, the Welsh Planning Commissioner, and other, um, other organisations. Um, and Colin, in addition to being um, all that Mighty said, is also one of our, um, now since he's retired um, officially, um, one of our um, um, associate consultants here at YAG. So um, we work quite a lot together these days on various, on various projects. And it's a great shame that Colin couldn't be here. Um, I've added his picture to, our, to the slides that he gave me just so that um, that you could at least have his presence initially. And what was really lovely was when um, um, I saw him last week uh, up in a seminar in, in Edinburgh, is he looks just like this. So even though he's had really quite major surgery, um, the good news is he's 90% better and, um, and he'll be here himself um, next time we do something. Um, so, what I just need to explain before I now start this presentation is that Colin prepared the slides that you will see. I've just corrected a couple of typos, and um, anyway, I think there's another one left that I didn't spot in time. And I've added a couple, one little image, um, but apart from that, it's all Colin's work. And it's the presentation that he prepared and sent to Maite and Clara and Bernie, I think, quite a while ago, when he was actually planning on being here. Um, when I said, yes, fine, I, I'll, why don't I um, do your presentation? I was thinking of other presentations I've seen where people get a script and they read it aloud. Um, I have no script. <laughs> I have no script, so you have to bear with me on that. I have sat with Colin and gone through some of the slides where I had no idea what he that, you know, might be. Um, and, I he, and I think he's told me his main points, but I apologise now if I don't have them all. So, um, but I'm sure there'll be a, a chance for Colin to maintain, you know, um, um, his, uh, his input to our, our work as a network. Okay, so this is where I start. Okay, this is the title, Poppy Jay's Pragmatism and Policy, a New Speaker Triptych. Okay, maybe I could offer a reward for anybody who thinks they know what's coming next. Okay, this might be a bit um, unclear, but I am sure as we go through this, that it will become clear that, we're, um, that Colin is really posing uh, three main aspects to what needs to be our agenda um, as researchers on new speakers. And you'll see in a moment that the idea of a triptych is, is part of this uh, uh, way of thinking. But to begin, just to say a few of the words that Colin would have said, um, um, Mike was talking about how happy he was to have been um, invited to be doing this. Um, talk, but he wanted to say joy and reticence. Um, initially, he was a little reticent just because he was aware that he hadn't been um, doing any, um, did, hadn't had any, didn't have any data really to do any linguistic analysis or a data that would initially feed in to what we um, were talking about as a network. But he wanted to um, acknowledge um, how persuasive we've been, particularly some of us, yourself, my say, Joan, uh, Bernie, um, and myself, in being sure that he would have an important role um, in the network. So huge thanks uh, from Colin 
uh, to the organisation, the organisers, uh, Clara and your team, as well as the COPS, COPS headquarters, of involving him. Um, and he wanted to say that he really welcomes the collaborative and intellectual collaboration that has really been quite impressive in the four years of the, of the network so far. And how the work that we're doing is really useful in thinking about new avenues of research and its application. So what's going to happen in the, in the rest of this presentation then is look at several of the issues um, which um, Colin sees as something that really, um, for us as a network, continue to vex and perplex us as we come to terms with using this new frame, uh, this new lens, this new set of insights of what we're trying to think about and, and identify thinking about new speakers. So this um, talk uh, reflects somewhat on the work that we've done as a network to date, but also looks forward to what we're doing um, beyond our funding uh, period. Okay. <laughs> Any ideas now why we have this uh, image? Triptych. It's triptych, yes, well done. <laughs> it seems very fitting for a World Heritage University. <laughs> But the point of this is not its religious um, function uh, or its religious significance. It's that triptychs are typically there to illuminate. They illuminate something. And so if you read for the middle panel, new speakers, then the idea that we're illuminating what we're trying to understand about speakers and people in modern and contemporary times, um, that is what we are illuminating in our, in our research. Um, and so the idea is that we get, we focus on, 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 on new speakers. Um, but just focusing on new speakers itself and having a dialogue amongst ourselves about new speakers um, doesn't get us very far unless we're opening up to other people um, and I will tell you, say a bit more about that. So this is the idea is that in order to move from being uh, working as a closed network to, to working in collaboration with others in order to make our research um, applicable and, and uh, useful then, um, then there are three main ways or three aspects to this. And this is where you start to see now other parts of the title of this project, uh, this presentation coming, uh, coming into focus. So the idea with this representation, and Colin shot the top of people's heads off, but anyway, there we are. <laughs> and we'll find another copy of this to replace it. But anyway, the point is, if you think of the middle column or the middle window as new speaker, as a new speaker or new speakers. <coughs> and then think of on the right, <coughs> on the right, um, if we think of that image as representing policy makers and decision makers, uh, if we think of that as the policy side, um, then on the left, this is supposed to represent us as researchers. Um, who are um, also what in this title um, Colin is referring to as popping jays. And I'll say a little bit more about how he sees us as popping jays. So this is the idea of the triptych then, that we're illuminating the idea or the lens or the issue of new speakers and we need to think about this three-way dynamic then of, of new speakers and, and the issues surrounding them, um, policy makers and so on, and then what are then our role is. And the idea being also to make a um, point to make here is that there's, for all of us in the network, and all of us in this room, some of us are um, working in organisations where you're part of making policy. Um, you are decision makers in the way that you decide how funding is spent um, on the various things that you're responsible for. Uh, so some of us who are here are, um, are uh, coming to that category of policy makers, decision makers, 
and so on. Some of us here are what we call new speakers, um, and, some of, and some of us also, of course, are, are researchers who are um, involved in this. So everybody has a role um, in, in the network, and I think that's also one of the, both the strengths of the network to date, but also a challenge to keep going and to maybe further enhance the dialogue across these three um, aspects as we move forward. So Popping Jays is in the title. I should have asked you before I put it up. What is a, what is a Popping Jay? Um, <coughs> a vein. A vein talking to person. I don't know if you can say it's saying that we're all vain. Um, but I think it's the idea of talkative and being a parrot. Um, and the idea that um, um, sorry, this image is supposed to represent. Um, actually, I'll turn that slightly. So, if I say something about more about popping jays, the idea is that just like parrots, we speak about new speakers often um, in our work, um, repeating other people's findings, statements, convictions, articulating <coughs> our work in relation to theirs. Um, but the emphasis here is. Well, that is an important role and an essential role um, that we have. We also need to action our ideas in a programmatic way. Um, and by doing so, we need to be having the repetition of our concerns, our findings. Um, and this is about looking forward then, beyond this point in, in time as far as our network is concerned, that we continue to repeat our concerns, our findings, our recommendations. This all needs to be continued so that the messages that we are developing um, within the network filter through into mainstream discourse and become a part of that discourse so that they are no longer seen as in any way exceptional, um, marginal or partisan, but part of the response that we are developing to the needs um, of growing linguistic diversity in our in our world. And I'll jump back to hopefully, yes, this image here. The idea is if we think of these as the popping jays, the the the, the work the role that we have as researchers, um, just repeating the truisms that we find in our data is not in itself enough. Um, it's not the same, and, and thinking about policy is not the same as analysing policy. And Colin wanted to emphasise the importance of analysing policy, because the real challenge for us is to engage with and influence policy makers in a consistent, not just in a random one-off kind of way, but it's a cohesive, coherent um, thing. And, and to also um, be politically savvy in what we do. And that's something that I'll, um, I'll, um, I'll refer to again. So the idea is that, yes, a poppy, we, we have a role as a poppy day, therefore, to be talking and, and repeating what we're saying. But the point is that it needs to also have a focus. It needs to be um, very calculated in a way as to how that is done, not just you know, just talking without, without focus, uh, or without focus. Right. Can you read this? I'm on the back. Okay. So, adagio rather than presto. I think this is a two, on two levels. I think, um, the idea is that I think as a network we've been very busy, um, almost rushing to to work out what what you know establish new speaker as a concept and how how useful that is and what can we theorise from the way that we're looking at at this issue. And I think one of the messages here is that um, we've done a lot, but we need to keep going in what we're doing and to not rush. You know, it doesn't have to all happen in four years. Um, this has been the start of a process that needs to take um, more time. Um, and talking about, okay, how by the questions we ask, uh, we are asking, we are creating a narrative um, about the issues that we're interested in. Um, 
and a reminder that we would make sure that our discourse is honest, edifying and relevant and not propaganda, that we don't stray into propaganda. I'll say some things which I'm not quite sure of myself, okay, because <laughs> he's written it down. Um, but I think this is always important, isn't it, to think about new speakers as, as individuals and souls and not just numbers, but to remember that at a policy level, uh, that decisions have to be made where new speakers can also maybe represent added value and diversity, these valuable things that people might recognise, but could also be posing a set of challenges. Um, it can be an unknown commodity, can have um, a cost um, to, in terms of implementation of whatever we're, we're looking at. Um, and this is another reminder that we should remember that new speakers are as capable as any other uh, type of person of political and policy manipulation. Um, so he's reminding us here that we need to be wary of not being either too naive or simplistic in the work we do um, in terms of our interpretation and our policy recommendations. We have to be really, um, really, um, really focused and really in tune with the policy context in which we all are working um, at a um, supranational and also national and local level so that we are careful in the, the way that we, that the evidence that we are um, highlighting um, is, is fed into policy um, in a way that is, is, is politically savvy and, and fully understanding of what we're about. <coughs> I think one of um, Colin's reflections is that maybe at this point we might want to admit that uh, much of the philosophy that we are using um, are somewhat derivative um, and that our theories at the moment are still in the process of being um, developed. Um, so yes, and this is now where I'm getting to a slide where Colin is you know, from reading the work that's been published by various people in the network and he's been kind of keeping quite a close eye on what we're doing. So this is his sort of take on, on where we're at. Um, but I think uh, an emphasis on the way in which the methodologies uh, that we are uh, employing are very well proven, uh, coming from larger from ethnographic educational policy management traditions. But one of the questions he asks is, you know, if we as uh, researchers are engaging with um, non-academic um, researchers and, and other people, well, where would the novice find a list of applications of the key concepts we're using? You know, how are we talking about um, what we're doing in a way that other people can easily access and understand? And then, of course, this... Um, Anybody who works with policy knows you have to um, be able to evaluate and, and prove and demonstrate how well your ideas are, are working. So asking that question at the bottom around how who yet has developed evaluative measurements to see how effective our approaches and interventions can be. And, um, and I think that's something maybe that we need to, to bear in mind, uh, particularly as we, as we um, move on um, in our future work. Relevance, scale and intimacy. So this is now uh, looking at um, the scope of our work um, in terms of these, let's see. So the first question he's asking is, is the new speaker concept more useful for a minority rather than hegemonic language context? I think maybe as we started out in this network, that that wasn't the intention at all. Uh, but maybe it has become dominant um, within the network, uh, that there is, like in this conference, there are more presentations and, and uh, panels looking at minoritized language context. Um, but that might be more to do with who's become involved in this network, um, rather than um, anything to do with the potential, the potential of the new speaker as a term, then it might not. So um, this is, uh, I think, an important uh, question for us to be considering. 
And then, in following on from that, um, asking the question whether there's a tendency in the context of minoritised languages to over-exaggerate the relevance of the new speaker to the vitality of these languages. And I think here is, this is a situation where it really depends perhaps on the language context. Um, it is, of course, a phenomenon that one sees um, um, in all contexts where there's increasing number um, of um, people who are learning a minoritised language who don't um, um, aren't brought up speaking that language in their home. But I think he's asking the question of we, maybe we need to be careful or we need to think about whether we're over exaggerating that role. Particularly perhaps when in a policy context you can see a lot of um, policy makers in terms of language policy putting a real focus on education as the main driver for maintaining and growing the numbers of speakers of whatever that minority language might be. And I think this is a warning that, okay, that's uh, important, but maybe it shouldn't be the, the total focus, particularly in some contexts where that might be relevant. Okay, um, so the next question then is, so who in reality are our new speakers? Um, I think some of us have been looking about that, um, looking at that question um, in the research that's been done. And um, I'm going to deviate a little from maybe Colin's intention here and have a little bit of audience participation. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a picture um, in a minute, well, in a second, um, of um, something. And I want to, I'd like to show of hands in a moment but if you think this person counts for you as a new speaker. Okay? So this person here. <laughs> This is Colin's photograph, to be fair, um, but I'd like to add something here. So the Prince of Wales, for those of you who may not be um, big fans and know exactly what it uh, does, um, then uh, he spent um, some time at Aberystwyth University um, when he was young, know, before, uh, before he was uh, made the Prince of Wales. So he, he spent, I think, a term uh, learning Welsh. Um, and he, you know, can read some Welsh in, um, in a certain formal, usually, environment. And I imagine you would say Borada or something like that. I mean, I have no idea really what, what, he, what he can actually do and what he does do. But just on that information, would any of you consider somebody who has this kind of amount of knowledge and amount of use of language, would you consider this as a new speaker? Would you consider him as a new speaker of Welsh? Anybody want to put their hands up for that? Nobody? Okay. okay, so that's interesting. So I don't know whether that's because of the, you know, what's, it, what's your position is on the Prince of Wales, if it's not allowed. You know, and if it was, and if it was somebody else. So how would you formulate the question then? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, in terms of uh, where you compare, uh, <laughs> just uh, maybe not now, but I can imagine some circumstances in which uh, some people may be interested in exploring the spirit of you know such people who who kind of must kind of learn language for more for ritual part of purpose. All the of the Spanish, yeah, the Spanish way of family. Okay. Uh, so I uh, would like to kind of like uh, try to think of a difference between how the Spanish or how the Spanish or the Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think I think this maybe makes the point, doesn't it? Is that some of these definitions <coughs> that we're working with aren't as very clear cut, and you have to start qualifying. Tell me what you think were. We asked Prince Charles, does he identify himself as a speaker of our team? Or just a prince? Yeah, <laughs> some people who have more limited um, knowledge of the language will identify themselves as speakers, um, even though other people might not. Exactly. I think the best example of that is Ireland, you know, where you've got a million, 1.7 billion speakers, according to themselves, but very low uh, actual ability and use. So, I mean, it depends on how you can say what is the concept of the, of the speaker, what does the speaker mean to the person. Yeah, okay, yeah. No, that's just a speech. Yeah. So, exactly, 
Well, so I think we're answering this question, aren't we? Is that, is that um, we need to be thinking about you know, who in reality are new speakers and whether we can generalise or whether we have to be very specific to a particular context is what, what kind of thing counts. Okay. Language is not an end in itself. <coughs> um, I'm just going to run through these really because he writes, of course, as a geographer. Um, but it's a necessary but not a sufficient requirement for interaction, yes. It provides opportunities for new interests, yes. Um, I think the point he's making here, though, also, as we move down these bullet points, is that um, particularly in the way in which language is used. Um, not just face to face, but in the digital space and interaction, and in new networks which are not necessarily physically rooted. Um, I think he has this notion that new speakers can tend to be passive participants in some forms of, of interaction. Um, and I maybe he would have given you some examples of how he thought that was, was the case. Um, but I think in this next point about it being a matter of where you place your energy and resources, I think learning a new language and acquiring language and, and making use of language, people have different priorities um, regarding where they are spending their energy and resources. So this is something that we of course have to remember. And then in the final point, I think this is particularly true, that most of the provision that we tend to think of is public sector resources in the education system, in the health sector, in the law, in the legal um, field and so on. Um, but he also makes the point that we also remember to, quite some of us are doing this, but it's important isn't it, to remember about the private and voluntary sectors and to think of those uh, examples. Um, particularly if they're evaluated in terms of outcomes. I'll talk more about outcomes, there's more and more to say about outcomes in, in the end, um, in the end of this talk. Right, this image is just to emphasise how new speakers need to be nurtured. <laughs> so I shall leave it at that. <laughs> Some of our evidence now, at, uh, sources of evidence at policy level. I think at policy level, when you're looking at official language policies um, pertaining to various nation states or language groups, the direct referencing of new speakers explicitly in those documents is, is very limited. Um, maybe in terms of Gaelic, um, Basque, um, Estonia, where there's specific mention of new speakers. But in many um, official language policies, there's indirect reference, you know, by talking about education and, and, um, and, and the diversity of, of, of the local community. So maybe not explicit reference to new speakers, but implicit and indirect references. Um, this box here on the right is, well, what, okay, I'll read it because it doesn't quite read it. What might this look like and how adequate would it be to convince one of previous attention having been paid to new speakers? I think what he's getting at here is we're calling it new speakers now, aren't we? And we're, talk we're drawing attention to new speakers. But of course, this is something that's been going on for, for a long time. We're talking about the kind of people we're talking about, but maybe not in this, in this way. And, and so part of our challenge, of course, is to engage with people who are, who are um, thinking about the people we're talking about in other ways, um, and therefore I need to pay attention to, to that. Um, and I think that I'll jump to the last one on the right here. Of course, you know, it's a tendency to exaggerate the pertinence of new speakers in policy interpretation. Um, yeah, I think again, it's more about steering a savvy course as to what emphasis we put and, 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 and being aware of, of the context in which we're, we're working. Right. So, integrative threads. I think the point he's making here is in the, in the central uh, box about is it possible to construct a convincing discourse about the universal needs of new speakers as a single category. 
Um, or are we better off disaggregating uh, the phenomena into particular needs? So that becomes needs um, in terms of integrating into the health, um, um, getting access, proper access within the health system, um, um, uh, needs within education, whatever those needs might be. Um, and therefore, should we be trying to prioritise them according to their name? Whether it's education practice and policy, immigrant adjustment policies, and so forth. And then the suggestion there that, well, maybe we have the headline of the universal nature of the phenomenon and illustrate the local example. I think we're kind of doing that, aren't we? I think. Um, but maybe the emphasis is this is, maybe we have to um, just like. You know, you can't, it's difficult to herd the cats. It's more about being thinking about you know, the directions we're all separately going in and having a kind of maybe a, a more focused direction, maybe in some ways. Um, and let's carry on in this next slide um, of um, asking the question of how relevant the concept of new speakers is to most situations and whether it travels equally well across cultures and policies. Um, of course, it's still tomorrow we'll be talking about uh, um, thinking about new speakers from a sub Saharan African perspective. But you can think about it from several perspectives. So the question is, how relevant is it? And I think he also, in this first bullet point, where he talks about all the fundamental differences in what counts as a new speaker by state and language regime, is being sensitive to, there are certainly some regimes where what, who we might be thinking of as new speakers would be defined within that within the discourse of that particular state as, as uh, in terms of race or in terms of colour or in terms of ethnicity in a problematic way. So I think this is pointing really maybe to, to the political complexity of, of, of what we're talking about here. Um, you mentioned again this inherent bias we have. Uh, on the context of new, new speakers in minority language situations. Um, well, that's exclusive, I think, about our work. He makes the point about what lessons can be learned uh, from looking at hegemonic contexts um, and people's acquisition of those languages. Um, and asking the question, can you see in the, in the let, what, last uh, bullet point, whether the, the hegemonic subordinate continuum is a useful access or not in, in analysing comparative context of new speakers. And I think one of the points he said I needed to make about this slide was, was how for policy makers it's impossible to do everything. Um, and so one has to be quite strategic in, 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 um, in, what, in what is possible. And then he has a slide about scale and hierarchy. Um, because all, overall and in general, our work is, is the presumption is that we're trying to influence um, the whole field of language policy and planning. Um, and most of the, the findings so far are pointing towards uh, pitching a discussion at the more the state or sub-state authority level. Um, which of course is important in and of itself, um, but he emphasises the importance of our emphasising other scales of language policy, right down to local um, bilingual education, for example, community development. I mean, we all know it's all macro, micro, <laughs> the scale isn't it, within, within this field. So, but it, the idea of also maybe emphasising our professional training bodies, language testing and evaluation commercial and private sector interests. I know one or two people here are going to be talking about uh, the private sector and commercial sector in one of the panels. Um, yes, so, so there we are. I think that's enough on that slide. Um, in terms of education, um, I know those of us who are working in, in, in the field of education are very aware of lots of, of, of issues that are specific to that. Colin really is drawing attention to two issues, well, one major issue is that there's a presumption, isn't there, in that minority languages such as Basque or Irish and other minority languages, they are accessed often through the hegemonic language. Um, and um, so he just emphasises and reminds us, of course, that you know, new speakers don't necessarily have the linguistic skills to coax them. 
simultaneously with two extra new languages. Um, and um, yes, and and then reminding us also that in hegemonic language teaching context, so the teaching of English, teaching of Spanish, teaching of Portuguese, whatever, that there's a huge amount of experience that takes account of linguistic the, the backgrounds, which are very, which are very important. So, a couple of thoughts on um, on uh, on education. Thoughts then on safe spaces. I've added a couple of pictures here because I'm not sure how many of you are aware. Because Colin may want to make this. The general point about about the importance of safe spaces, um, which are spaces which facilitate um, opportunities and usage, and maybe drawing on what um, Joanne was saying earlier, that you know how for us it's very easy to not be aware of how difficult it can be to feel uh, safe to um, to use language in the way that we want to be learning and um, so. Colin mentioned um, um, the Canal by my um, which is something that's kind of developed in the Welsh context more recently. Um, Tea Tower um, in Swansea is a combination of um, the Welsh local mentaliaeth and, and creating a, a, a physical space um, that and, and facilitates people to, to do all kinds of things. Um, and so I thought I saw as another example. I couldn't find a picture, sorry, Steve, of actually the Sea Tower on when I was Googling last night. So I, I bought this picture here of Canal Soa where, where where the building on the um, where where you basically have a situation where the old chapel has been developed into a centre by getting extra building that's been added to it and re renovated. So the idea that people are using these spaces, and I think Tea Tower, which Steve will be talking about um, tomorrow when he makes his presentation <coughs> on the panels, um, and Canal Mansour are both examples of, of these centres that have been created really with grassroots momentum um, and, and support. And, and oh, well, that was really useful in the research that um, Steve, I'm looking for my class here, but there it is, and Haley, who may or may not be here yet, Haley Griffin, that your research was very um, influential in persuading the Welsh Government that more funding should be given for these kinds of centres. Um, but I think Steve will share with me that Aaron Collin, when he mentions at the bottom, that we have to be careful about the way in which community uh, bottom up initiatives can be diluted if driven by government, where the government, you know, your condition of funding is that you have certain targets and uh, things that you have to meet, which might be more government um, uh, focused and, um, and community based. Right. My notes. Um, this is just talking about. Um, Basically, the cost and benefits, as it says in the title. Um, but he's asking the question whether we need to emphasise and make more explicit the costs that are involved um, in uh, providing um, support for um, um, different kinds of migrants and maybe um, defending the need for that expenditure um, because, of course, cost cutting is something which, which affects. Um, affects policy decisions um, in these uh, contexts. In the second bullet point, he's paying attention to, of course, the social, social psychological costs for migrants um, and what that might, the implications that might have for not being able to fully adjust to the new language context. Um, yes, and then, I'm not going to go through all the bullet points because that would just be even more depth by power, but if we go to the last the, the point we made there is, I think, important is that some courses um, for new speakers of a language, you know, to how to what extent are they actually effective as an integrative means of helping people to become part of the society they're now living in or the community they're now living in, and whether they are just a symbolic, have a symbolic function. Um, and I think that's an important point to be, to be made. Um, then, uh, <coughs> sorry, I'm thinking of something else there. Um, um, yes, I was 
was just thinking about, you know, in terms of policy, sometimes it's the legislation that becomes a trigger, and then it's the long march then through, you know, through organisations to, to actually put all this into practice. My thinking is it was like a long march through the PowerPoint at the moment of all these slides. So I hope it's not, uh, not too difficult for you. Um, but, um, I mean, you have Colin's text, and to be honest, I'm, I'm really just, as you can see, just voicing what he's put down, down here. Um, but I think the point that he's making here is to do with, um, you know, how we're thinking about new speakers in terms of being um, inhabitants of a new place, uh, residents of a particular place, or citizens of a, of a new place, and, um, and how that process um, of of integration, but that process of change, that process um, takes place, and, and how some of our research actually is to do with looking at that um, in detail. Um, but there are questions also to be asked, um, and there are a couple of questions there, such as, is there a strong territorial identification um, in the motiv motivation of the students to fit in? And of course, that will vary according to, to context, and I think that's a uh, an important question that we're looking at is, is how that whole process um, is experienced. Then, um, of course, rights are important, um, and um, and it's perhaps a feature of the current climate in which we're in, um, in which there is reduced funding of a tendency for using ICT applications as, a, as the easiest way to, um, to for political, well, government authorities to, to be making provision. Um, and I think he was referenced, uh, Colin is then referencing the research done by colleagues in Tilburg that, that points to that double bind that exists for new speakers with having to not just familiarise themselves with new languages, but also a command or a fluency in certain ICT um, practices and how that um, is an issue. And of course, remind us that in a neoliberal context, then um, ICT provision always puts the onus on the individual to succeed or to fail. Um, so, it, which makes this wider agenda of trying to um, encourage positive outcomes for the experience of these people maybe more difficult. To, um, to predict and to assess and to modify through uh, policy um, and practice. So that becomes quite complex. How many? Um, I'm just working out where I am in terms of time. Okay. Um, experience and evaluation.
we don't, you know, there's a, there's a limited value to research um, which points to, okay, we need, um, you know, more hours of this or more hours of that or more of this or more of that. But what is the actual outcome of that extra whatever it is we're talking about? Because we're talking about changing behaviour, we're talking about changing uh, people's lived reality, not just how many classes have been funded or, or, or how many new teachers there are or how many whatever. We're not just talking about numbers here, we're talking about what is the actual outcome. And if he were here, he would have energized more lyrically than me about, of course, the impact of the re regulatory state, uh, which is such a feature, isn't it, of um, the context of, our, um, of, of where we are working and living these days. And so, in most of the context we're looking at, then there is increased regulation, and more robust language testing regimes and strictures on mobility. And the, what does this then tell us about the future prospects of many new speakers? You know, when we were talking about a specific a time in which this shaping um, so much of, of, um, of people's day-to-day -day lives. And what then is the role, of course? Um, of the law and the legal regime in influencing the discourse on new speakers. Um, that's uh, quite important to be aware of. Um, and do we have examples across our network of sites where there are prohibited prohibitions on new speakers? Um, and if there are prohibitions on new speakers, well, what is the ideological and justification that's given for those prohibitions? Um, the, the way in which our research is trying to engage with an impact on policy. Um, and I think the question he's asking here is that we need to be mindful when we think about our research, when we think about our findings, is are they going to be sufficiently robust um, to be adopted in policy formulation? And should our um, uh, recommendations and should our pronouncements on what policy should look like be a focus explicitly on your speakers specifically um, or be, uh, be just an aspect of wider um, recommendations in the fields of education and language and the workplace and integration policies. So that's what the third bullet point is about. Is it more advisable to include recommendations on these things within a continuum of policy needs and remedial actions? And so this is really just emphasising how our thoughts on new speakers need to be not just new speakers, of course, because we're talking about certain people within what are otherwise wider fields where people are de developing policy. Um, and so maybe that's something that we also need to think about. Okay. And then how um, saving it, of course, thinking on a multi-level um, of policy level uh, implementation. That's also an institutional healthcare agency and so forth. So, so yes, it's a huge task, isn't it? <laughs> we have to be thinking about all these different um, levels. And, um, okay, now to do with, again, policy, um, asking the question whether the reference to new speakers in policy um, is a reflection of the notional assent or real assent. So this is a term which referring to Cardinal Newman making in 1852, but the point here is, is that window dressing is not enough. Yeah. So it's important for um, real assent, for actual um, 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 recognition of whatever the cause specifically is within for a new species in a particular context. So the idea is, is it mere, mere signification or conviction policy? Um, because, sorry, policy making, because it's the latter um, that is the most important, and it's the latter, it's a conviction policy making, policy making which is actually not just um, just done as a superficial or just as 
the indicative um, um, words, but um, where where policy is actually formulated in a way that is actually intended to succeed, and the importance then of demonstrating evidence of good practice and best practice to, to support the need for uh, those policy making decisions. Because policy makers, of course, are always looking for evidence, best evidence, best practice, that can be a justification then for the spending that we're asking them to make, or the policy uh, focus we're asking them to, to focus upon. Okay. And the point at the end, I think, is important in the last se second sentence of this last bullet point. The hegemonic majority is key to the overall process and their view should be factored into policy formulation. Um, because of course, um, we are, uh, any policy or any, any attempt to, to uh, push a policy agenda for new speakers is challenging the current hegemony, isn't it? We're, we're not talking about, it. oh yes, all right, then go on, why not? Here's a check, I'll, you know, five billion for you for doing that. That's not gonna happen. So it, it's really about emphasizing how we are, um, Whatever area we're researching um, in, in specifically um, is potentially trying to make changes to an existing um, policy where um, the people who have the power um, uh, are maybe not as sympathetic um, to the uh, experiences of new speakers. Right. This is where we have to enable gaze and accept that. You know, we don't know everything, we are weak, <laughs> there are mistakes in our work and there are errors and so we just need to acknowledge this, but acknowledge it as a way of learning from that and, and, and recognising that that is a part of paradigmatic change. Um, and we should um, also not assume that any language you speak of policy is necessarily going to be popular or politically acceptable and that we have to fight for it. Um, just like any other intrusive or additional policy. But of course the goal then is, as it says in the bottom um, uh, bullet point, to, make, to aim for it to become mainstream and, and enriched as a part of our ongoing analysis. So this is really about, um, you know, we've got a long job, all of us, ahead of us um, in this respect. Okay, a minute. Okay, so I don't think I need to go through this list. Um, the idea being that these are the layers of influence. Um, some of us might be trying to intervene and influence on certain levels, um, others at other levels. And this is all important. And of course, there are all these different ways um, of influencing um, discourse, of influencing policy, and of influencing practice. Um, and then, um, just to signal for future work. Um, about being very clear about where we're trying to go um, in terms of the work that needs to be done and the challenges that we need to face and identify very clearly who the stakeholders or the agencies are that are most likely to benefit from and learn from and adopt some of our recommendations. So this is all um, important um, that we have. We're clear basically about that and not just so focused on our on our data and on our um, you know what we're thinking about in academic terms that we're also clear about where we're trying to go um, with this. And um, then uh, this is again looking to the future of the network um, as we move on beyond our um, time of having this funding that we've had. Um, but you know where are we going? Um, and what will happen, and do our ideas and our contributions, is that as we just say, okay, well, there we are, we did that for four years and that's it, or do we have ideas and contributions that are sufficiently, um, you know, <coughs> sufficient to, to, um, to continue to try and influence the policy communities that we're trying to influence at this point? And then how do we try and do that? And I think the last point, of course, is important, isn't it? And I think several of us have been asking this, um, and we'll continue to ask them, how do we engage new speakers themselves uh, to take some ownership of the policy influence and process rather than just speaking on people's behalf? So, he ends with this question. 
Do we need new speech? You know, do we need new ways of thinking about what we're doing? Um, and I don't know if you had an answer to, to put there. Um, but I think this is a question for us to consider, really. Um, and I'd just like to finish with his final slide here, which is basically to put an emphasis on these three aspects of, if you like, the triptych of um, work, work on new speakers. The importance of evidence and the need for even further, greater collaborative and cross-contextual analysis of real-world experiences uh, as being absolutely central to what we're doing. And then in terms of policy, being very pragmatic and politically savvy um, in terms of pushing to embed programmes which assist new speakers within official policies. And then the key issue, of course, is outcome. Because we need to be about creating outcomes which affect real change for the myriad types um, of people who come under our new category uh, speaker or, or our category of new speakers. Um, so it's not, as I was saying before, not just a question of focusing on outputs, but on, on, on interventions that will affect real change in behaviour and change in access to services or whatever it is that we're trying to do. Obrigada.